We have a guest in the studio with us today. So what's your name? Talk to us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Zach Aton, and I teach in uh, New York City Public School in Brooklyn, New York. I teach earth science currently in a high school, and I teach urban ecology. And I also have a course that I teach, uh, which is engineering, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. It's a STEM course. Um, for the most part, I like what I do. Mm -hmm. How did you come across Mr. Sheehan? We had an idea to have a documentary lesson on rats since it was a course named Urban Ecology. Um, rats are part of the New York City Urban Ecology. Um, especially if you take the train, I mean, the rats are everywhere. Um, and uh, we figured let's just show the students a documentary on rats when it just came out and um, have them take notes and then I had the students also write an essay so every one of my students wrote an essay on this documentary all the uh, the science that's involved with uh, rodentology and also just the ecology of rats how they got to North America and they were really surprised to hear that rats are not native to North America they came here from uh, uh, Europe uh, just like horses for example are not native to North America um, uh, we looked up Ed just out of curiosity, and I just had this idea to have him in and uh, as an expert talk, and Ed was very gracious to come in, and uh, everybody fell in love with Ed. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, as his son, that seems to be the case. But um, so did you learn anything from the documentary that you didn't previously know? Yes, I've learned that rats are not native uh, to North America. Uh, they came here via the ships, via sh uh, on the ships of, uh, of Europe. That was really interesting to learn. Um, it was also interesting to learn that rats are evolving to be smarter, larger, um, tolerant to rodenticide. Um, and it was interesting to learn about their community, um, how they have this hierarchy in their community, just like humans do. Um, uh, when Ed said, you know, um, when, when there's some new food that is available, uh, the rats will send the weak one. Uh, Ed said something like, oh, Joey, let's, let's send Joey or Mikey um, to go check out uh, the food. And then they see if uh, that weak one does not die, then they'll go in and uh, eat uh, the food themselves. But if that weak one dies, then they won't touch it, which is a very smart, educated way of, well, not educated, but it's a smart way to to handle things, uh, to stay alive. Um, yeah, a couple of more things, but those were the more, the ones that stood out the most. In the urban ecology, um, rats, do you, did you touch on other pests? We touched on uh, parasites. that are discussed in urban ecology in the rats documentary because before the rats study we uh, did a whole unit on parasites anything from the bot fly to the ringworm or all kinds of tapeworms um, uh, the students were disgusted by it but also they learn about it um, and we've learned that these rats also carry uh, parasites such as the bot fly such as these worms um, especially uh, the part in Louisiana after uh, the hurricane there. Um, they, there was a part in the documentary where uh, they take out um, a worm out of a rat's intestine with tweezers and the worm is still alive, <laughs> even though the rat was dead or under a uh, tranquilizer. And the kids all said, Ew, oh, I'm never going to touch her. You know, I'm going to stay away from the rat. And, So this podcast is mainly on education and, you know, the urban ecology part, but the urban planning also in New York City, 
as of late has taken Ronan abatement into more consideration and more seriously. We were talking earlier before the podcast started about the rat birth control that's coming out. And you're going to see this, I think, implemented more and more in public parks because of its low toxicity and its effect on the human population and the environment. And it really only affects the rats. And this particular product is actually uh, PETA loves it because it's not really harming the rats they don't so it's funny Peter endorses the product it's P-E-T-A not a guy named Peter <laughs> yeah Peter endorses the product they protest the laboratory of this company because they're testing on rats just saying um, I enjoy uh, doing the um, going up and talking to the kids because something you know we want the younger uh, generation to see that uh, pest control is not somebody running around throwing poison and I thought that that um, uh, documentary on rats did it well because they show all of these scientists, all the experiments that uh, go on. And um, with Dr. Cargan, um, they're downtown Manhattan when they start kicking this garbage and the rats come flying out, which was which is a pet peeve of mine for years. I remember a couple of years ago being in um, Budapest, Hungary, and I'm, I took pictures of their garbage cans because they were all slick-sided. The rats couldn't get a... A hold, and next thing I see, uh, Bobby Corrigan uh, talk to the powers that be, and we're now seeing a lot of slick-sided garbage cans, so we're cutting off some source of food, but not enough. The, we put a, you know, you see in, in, in the film that um, the garbage goes out at 6 or 7 o'clock at night, but don't get picked up till 4, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, and I, I've seen it when I've been out on some of the night patrols, they put the garbage out, and five, ten minutes later, the rats come popping out of their burrows, and they're in there eating it. So I think the movie was, um, I enjoyed it because it educated the younger generation that there's exterminators out there, and a little more than just throwing um, uh, poison around. And he also stressed to them during the talks that um, they could become an exterminator, but they have to take two state tests and whatever. So we're passing on the knowledge. Education is the key to getting your customer on board and really getting rid of the problem. And, and you know that we've been involved in a lot of construction sites and development sites. One of the things in a meeting that stood out that, uh, that we joke about to this day is when the guy said, ah, an exterminator is an exterminator. And then after he saw our program, he was like, you know, I, I really didn't think there was ever a difference. I just figured there's a road in abatement. It's a line item in the construction plan that we check off. And that's it. But then everybody ends up. This is how you end up. And we've t- told these stories before. You end up with rats on a 77th floor in a high-rise apartment building during construction. You end up with rats on a 55th floor. And it's because that is just a line item and it's not seen as something that is necessary. And I think we're getting more and more into that. And the developers that we deal with and construction companies that we are dealing with uh, or have dealt with are now calling us and saying, you know, uh, we like what you did, and, and we have a whole road in abatement program. But it, it's part of uh, urban ecology and urban planning that this is what really needs to be thought of and in a more in-depth way because, you, you, you know, construction sites are breeding grounds for rats. I've been in this business 50 years, and um, I, be, I was an exterminator running around with a couple of days growth ripped jeans. Nobody cared. And uh, I gradually became a pest management professional. And what I learned, um, yes, I am an exterminator. I'm a pest management professional, but I'm also an educator. I have to educate my customers, let them know what they can and cannot expect. And I don't overpromise and underdeliver. You underpromise and overdeliver. And the other thing, I became a caterer. Um, these baits that we use, um, they're more effective and we can sort of look at who we want to suppress and see their habits. Where do they travel? Where do they hang out? How do they, if you want to call, get to work? Where do, how do they travel to their food source? And we would put our food uh, in, their place, in, in, in their way. So here, we're, we're actually delivering. We deliver. So it, it changed those two ways dramatically. Not as much spray and a lot more education to the customers. And... and um, we still educate ourselves because not only do we have to get the credits to renew, but if you're really serious, you're going to all of these conferences, for example, down in Orlando, out to Denver, wherever, to learn something new, to get an edge.
I think what you're talking about is the national pest management stuff. Also, local associations and local seminars, like he's saying. Um, but just going back on urban planning and construction sites, and for those of you out there from a business aspect trying to figure out, how do I even get to know about this? Um, and wherever you are, I, I imagine there's a BOMA uh, association, which is um, <clears throat> something that you should become a part of. There's local organizations uh, a guild or a, um, a management group of building managers, but BOMA is Building Owners and Management Association. And this is, this is a good place to start if you're not sure because if you Google it, BOMA is an international um, group. Um, I would, as we're talking about speaking and education, you want to get in front of these groups and have, uh, you know, PowerPoint could be your best friend or you might hate it, but to, to have these where you could send it out in a PDF form and say, I'd like to come and speak for free and get your name out there and what you do. And then you'll start to see like with, with my father, people start to remember you for what you spoke about. And then on top of it, they say, hey, remember that guy that spoke? We should get him in here because he seemed to know what he was talking about. And we have this problem that our current pest management person can't fix. So education overall is key. And you kind of need to train your customer and train them into how you do things. I mean, we go into places all the time and they tell us this isn't how the guy used to do it. And then instead of just saying, well, this is how we do it. We explain it and educate them on the whys, why we don't come in and spray everywhere the first time, which touches back to IPM that you'll have heard about in a previous podcast. So education slash training of your customer is key. And and joining these other groups and wherever you are, you'll you'll figure it out by Googling management groups, building management groups, Bomer is a big one. Um, and then just getting in and educating them and that's how you can get some of these construction sites. In New York City, before you can demo a building, you need to have a road and abatement um, program in place. And as the pest management professional, we have to sign off that it was handled and that the, the we've monitored the site for, I believe it's a minimum of two weeks, and that there's been no rodent signs or activity for those two weeks. We sign off on it, give it to the construction company. The construction company then gives it to the city agencies, and then they're allowed to demo the building. So you, you get involved with these agencies um, or these groups, and they, once they get to know you, they'll call you. There's building. I mean, one thing about urban planning is there's constantly buildings going up and coming down. And from a scientific standpoint, um, you mentioned um, um, these building permits um, that they need clearance from the pest management, from a pest management company before a building can go up and they're going up and down. Another um, issue right now um, in the scientific community um, that relates to urban ecology is climate change. And um, with climate change, um, one thing that is associated is uh, the rise of water or more presence of water, be it through hurricanes or sea level rise. Um, data shows that more hurricanes are, are, are we're, we're getting more of them. Um, we will get more of them. Um, and uh, with that presence of water will also come the presence of pests, uh, rats being part of them. Um, such as, uh, for example, in the documentary in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, their rat problem has um, increased drastically after Hurricane Katrina. So um, what climatologists are telling us today is that we will see more Katrinas in the next uh, 50 years uh, coming, even 20 years coming. So uh, this is definitely a, um, an issue uh, to consider. Um, if, if climate change does um, take off as the scientists are, are predicting it will, so will the uh, pest problem will take off as yep. well. So 100%. So, um, so rats, we talked about rats earlier. In New York City, we currently only have the Norway rat. But there's a roof rat that we, not too many people in New York even know how to deal with except for what we've read in books. But, and I believe this is a product of climate change as well, they are now as far north as Maryland, which in the past they've never to my knowledge, been passed. They're on the their way. But they've never been past the Carolinas. So, and, and the other thing, too, with, with climate change, you're going to have more mosquito issues. Um, there are other bugs that we have stink bugs now here, and there's, a, um, there's, other, there's other pests that are coming 
into the north northeast is our territory so that that are just coming and it is again due to the climate change and that they're able to sustain the winters are mo- less mild etc so they're able to sustain life over here even those parrots not less mild y- less cold yeah even the parrots so you're from brooklyn do you know the green parrots are all up and down flappish avenue and they were never supposed to the monk parakeets they were never supposed to survive. When the crate broke in JFK, it was, they'll never survive. They're a tropical pest. And what did they do? They adapted and they built their nests in the Transformers, which I'm sure is very safe. But they built their nests in Transformers, and they started off in, like, the east. What is the Avenue J over there? What is that section? Flatbush. That's like Flatbush. Flatbush, Flatbush Midwood. They started off there. They're in Brooklyn Now they're College. everywhere. Yeah. Right. So I was, in, I was there one night when I was going to school. And here's a pigeon, and he's trying to take food from the parrot, which was like half the size of him. And the parrot gave him a couple of pam pam with the wings and then pecked him, and the pigeon walked away. He goes, I like mm-hmm. that tough little monkey <laughs> like that. So, yeah, it, nature, is wo- nature is wonderful. They really can adapt. Um, unfortunately, in our case, uh, they may adapt to some of the poisonings, or it could be an error on our part where we don't use enough or we, weren't, we didn't place it properly. But... Our manufacturers and our scientists are constantly striving for better, better results. I would agree with that, but the the problem is the elected officials and the government agencies. Where, mm-hmm. like in 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 New Orleans, like you were talking about, um, any good pest management professional would be able to tell you. With that amount of garbage, there should be a rodent plan in place, and there probably wasn't. Or if there was, it was given to the lowest bidder, and I think everybody knows what the lowest bidder is all about. It's it's not the same quality of work as someone in the middle and the the plan again it's just a line item that this, the government needed to check off yeah we got a road abatement plan in place while we clean up after katrina or while we clean up after sandy or whatever they clean up it's it's, it's after it's a line item but there's no like the real thought is not put into it the, and new york city to their credit hired bobby corrigan probably 10 years ago yeah 10 years easy, ago or more and that's and and so now it's funny. Ten years ago they hired him, and and now as of last year, you're just seeing those new um, sanitation garbage bins in the street that are that are rat proof because of the slick sides and they're all metal. But um, it also goes to show you, like from a small business standpoint, we're like a speedboat, and we could change on a dime and adapt to whatever's going on. And in, in a go- government, municipality, state, city organization, it it's. It's like a cruise liner, and and I got those analogies from you, sir. It just takes longer for things to change, but sometimes, it, and the rodents are changing so quickly, and for us to change to it, for 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 a private industry, small company, it's easy, and the larger you are, the harder it gets. And by the time you change to what they adapted to two years ago, they've adapted again. And I think we just the better plans need to put in place for the future, especially if we see. If all the scientists are true, which I happen to believe they are, as the climate changes, we're going to deal with a whole new everything. I mean, could you imagine New York City was summer all year long? Right now, we get a lull for pests. I have to go up to Maine. I have to go up to Maine. See, Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it all comes back, I believe, uh, like you said before, to education, educating the public, um, the, the importance of awareness of this uh, pest control business. Um, and that um, with climate, the pest um, ecology will change, and that we need to kind of be on top of that change. Um, you gotta, it's like you're tap dancing. Yeah. You got you to gotta, you gotta <coughs> do a different step. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it even like anything that we do for every action is a reaction, right? All of these uh, rooftop gardens, urban gardens that started so many years ago, and people didn't even necessarily think about pests because it was on the 18th, 20th, 50th floor of the building. Yeah, yep. they're, there. they're coming, yep. uh, you know, and, and not for nothing. We're kind of bringing them. You're buying the soil, you're buying the mulch, you're buying all this stuff. They're probably already embedded in the soil and mulch. So, yeah, OK, maybe they're not going to fly up to the 55th floor, although they'll get trapped in an elevator and come up or come in with other people's stuff. But. People didn't think of it, and then all of a sudden, they're like, God, this doesn't make any sense. Your pest control program is terrible. And we're like, well, no, not really. You put a garden on the roof. Yeah. You got to read so, the contract. It yeah. wasn't in the contract. Yeah, well, that, you just did it. It wasn't in the contract. Now we'll handle it for you. I think sure. it follows the mind. If you build it, they will come. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what else? Okay, just have a quick question, because I was doing some searching, um, some Instagram, you know, wasting time last night. 
and I found a couple of different pages of with people who have pet rats. There's a lovely lady in New Jersey who has a rat rescue. Just, you know, what, what kind of myths and so on do you think really kind of need to be debunked? Because as we are here, we look at rats as disgusting animals. We see them in the subway. We consider them as dirty, always related to garbage. But... On the other hand, this page has thousands of followers and people talking about how much they love rats and pictures of their pet rats crawling all over them and why they make such great pets. So what is it? Okay, those rats, the ones that I've seen are hooded rats. They're bred in captivity. Um, Domesticated, if you will. Okay, now, now, you know, when I was a kid, I had pigeons. And everybody's like, oh, pigeons, they're crapping all over. They're disease carriers. And that's very true. But the pigeons I had had bloodlines. Um, they got medicine. They were given a certain feed. They were monitored. They were exercised regularly. They had a nice uh, coop that they stayed in. Um, the young, um, uh, we would selectively breed different pigeons with different pigeons. They weren't your ratty pigeons out in the street. So those rats that people are saying, oh, how could you say that? Well, that rat that you're talking about, um, he wasn't a street rat. And I'll tell you what, I'd like to get a couple of these people, and I'll catch a couple of street rats, and I'll bring them over to you and see how fast you want to cuddle this slimy, disease-ridden ass. It would be really interesting to see an alpha male from... From the street. Yeah. <laughs> I went there and kicked the shit out of all of those pansy asses. But there's just a difference, and... Rats all communal like us, and I could see somebody having a pet rat, and uh, my sister had a pet rat, <laughs> and we made fun of her all the time for it. She had a pet rat. It was black and white. It was domesticated. It bit me all the time, but didn't bite anybody else, of course. She was intelligent. Well, I, I could tell you, no, this rat, the rat's name was Algernon, and this rat was beating up the other rats. So we said, okay, we'll take this rat. It was a female rat. So we're looking at the rat, me and my office manager, Sammy, and we decided that this rat was, uh, was hostile because it needed a mate. So we go over to our local uh, pet shop, and we say, we need, a, we, need a ma we need a male. So we throw the male in there, <laughs> and we come in the next morning, and she bit them all around the eyes, and she beat the crap out of them. I go, holy God. So we decided she was, you know, we couldn't, we kept her, but we didn't put any more any more male, men or women in there with her. She was just a rat with a nasty attitude. I mean, you meet people like that too frequently, but that's the best I could. The other story I remember about that, I was talking to my son, Joey, and I said, well, at least she's got rats, so not too many guys are going to date her. And the response was, yeah, yeah, except guys that like rats too, which kind of <laughs> scared me. <laughs> But she had a pet rat. She would let it crawl on her. She would hang out with it. It was certainly a companion type pet. Um, but again, domesticated. And like Ed, like Ed said, similar to the pigeons he had, these rats, I highly doubt that they were ever street rats or where they came from. It's the same kind of like lab rats, the white rats that you see. These are domesticated rats that people are... Uh, are having a dare say relationships with uh, as pets and it's not the same as, as a rat in the street that's disease infested that is crawling into your food stuff and and messing up the economy in a sense by having to throw out food uh getting people sick when we don't know that they're in the food and then people are serving the food so it, there's a difference and people that wouldn't agree with us are, are just delusional Be they are you gotta kill you got to get rid of, suppress, as Ed Sheen would say, the uh, the rats in the streets. You know, somebody has rats in their house, fine, go ahead. So would you say that they can make a good pet, though, since you had one? Uh, I, I didn't have one except that one in the office who was a little nasty little bastard. But, yes, I could see where they'd make a good pet for certain people. May I add something? Sure. Uh, when Ed came to our classroom, if... You remember, Ed, we had two hooded rats yeah. um, in the classroom. Um, there were two males. Um, that, that first year we got them, there were babies. Um, the kids played with them. Uh, they were safe to play with. Um, they were obviously bred and held in captivity. Um, what happened was um, after that first year, 
Joe took them home. Joe was the other science teacher. And uh, one of the rats either started eating the other rat or ki somehow killed the other rat and um, became violent. I guess um, like many um, of these pets, uh, for example, like monkeys, uh, primates, um, some humans uh, keep uh, monkeys as pets at home, but once they reach puberty, um, they became become very violent. Yeah. And the same it was the same thing with uh, raccoons. Uh, there was a time in, uh, that the Japanese not too long ago started importing raccoons from North America. And um, raccoons also, when they reach um, the age of puberty, they become violent. Uh, so people just release them into the wild. And um, the raccoons in Japan have expanded in the wild and they caused all kinds of problems, building damages and things like that. The same thing with these rats, and Ed was absolutely right. Um, they're cute, they're nice, but after all, um, they're animals. And um, when they reach the age of puberty, um, uh, they do become violent. Um, most, of, most of the time, mostly we keep dogs and cats as pets. Um, they're a lot more intelligent, um, and they somehow you know, obey the master. And uh, that's okay. one thing. And that's one thing. And then, two, uh, don't forget that dogs and cats were bred for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years to have, you know, we selected um, right. them genetically, um, those specific ones that are not violent uh, and uh, those that do uh, respect the master, for example. But with the rats, we haven't. There's, it's it's not a, a common a thing to time, keep yeah. rats. And therefore, you're not you never know what type of rat you're going to get at the store. I have a question for you. We've asked this before talking about rats and in the documentary with how Vietnam or Cambodia, whoever was catching the rats in the fields and then selling them. Would you eat a rat? That would was a question that came up uh, in the classroom um, a few times. And uh, some students raised their hands and said, yeah, I would eat a rat. Um, I would eat a rat. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Not how the Cambodians do it. I would eat them um, if they were FDA approved. <laughs> yeah, they could be far What about like, trust the FDA? Then, right? So um, there's a, there's, and you might be interested in this, the Entomological Society sponsors insect eating or, what, what, what is it again? It's a new thing. Eating insects is this yeah. new. Yes. So would, would you, do you think you would do that? Like chocolate insects. covered insects or would it be an FDA approved thing as well or? After listening to a science podcast recently on insects and how this is a new evolution in American, and it's making its way into the American food system, yeah, I would. They have insect um, uh, flour now that they sell that is uh, high in protein and it's very healthy. And you make bread with it, or you can make chips with it, cook with it, bake with it. Um, and the taste difference, you wouldn't even notice that there's a taste difference, and it's, it's healthier. Yeah, um, there's, there's a concern now with the population rising so quickly for a food source, and they're, they're identifying things that we haven't eaten. But, you know, get to get back, if I would eat a rat, if I was starving, I'd eat a rat. And I was over in Ireland many years ago, and we had chicken at my aunt's farm, and I said it was nice, and she said, want more tomorrow night? I said, yeah, not eating chicken all my life. She gave me a hatchet and told me to go grab one. Yeah, I had to think. Of, had to think about it. So, yeah. if I was brought up where we had rats for dinner or rats, rat sandwiches, you know, like you say, as long as it's FDA approved, why not? It's high in protein. You also got to remember that this is America, and it's com everything that we're talking about is is practice. You know, they they eat dogs in Korea. Um, so everybody had, like you said, what you what you're raised with. Um, they're eating insects and other as a food source in in parts of the world. So, it's just us in America. Like for us, we're like ill to like everything. Well, they had chocolate covered ants when I was in Paris in two thousand. So, mm -hmm. well, not too long ago, sushi was the ill. Also, um, sushi became popular in America. Again, I'm quoting uh, this podcast I recently listened to. Sushi became popular in America back in 1980s, uh, mid-80s, and uh, it was some rock artists uh, uh, that, that started advertising it in Rolling Stones magazine. They had the sushi, and that's how it came about. And um, everybody was saying raw fish, ill, 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 and look at it. Now, mid-90s, it really blew up. Yeah. Um, and they're saying that it would be the same thing with uh, insects soon. <laughs> you, know, you, 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 you had a good sales pitch. Anything's yeah. possible. Yeah. 
Yeah, all you need is a couple of pop artists to start eating insects, and there you go. <laughs> That's how I'm... <laughs> and just to tie it back into education, once you realize through someone educating you on it that it's high in protein, it's better for you, and and the taste is not that different, through that education portion, it'll change the way we eat or look at things. I mean, from the... From the from the ra- uh, horrimentary rats, you you know, they, there was no indication that rats will ever be healthy for you to eat. <laughs> Cer- certainly not rats from the wild. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. I go by Mr. Aton to my students, teaching at Northside Charter High School, science, urban ecology, earth science, uh, and engineering. I want to give a shout out to all of my students. I love you all. Um, my uh, co-workers, uh, it's a great team. The administration for having me, for giving me the opportunity to bring in all of these creative um, ideas into the classroom. And um, science rocks. Hi, this is Ed Sheehan again. I want to thank you for tuning into Colony Confidential. As you see, we're expanding out in other areas, uh, all of which are helpful to you. Uh, not only if you're in business, but also if you're a layperson. Uh, if you have any comments, good, bad, or indifferent, why don't you let us know at colonyconfidential at gmail.com.